So there are several games across the country that have not gotten their proper spotlight this week. So let's shine some spotlight on some of these week two games. Washington is at Michigan. Michigan is favored by seven. This is a Saturday night, eight o'clock Eastern time kickoff on ABC. Michigan played Western Michigan last week. It was a game that people kind of whispered. It was one of those games where people said, hey, watch out for Western Michigan. And they say it on like Wednesday so they can have it on the record. But then when Michigan won going away, you never hear about it again. It was one of those kind of games. Well, Michigan, not only did they win, they hung, uh, what was it, about eight yards per carry. They're not going to do that against Washington. I'm pretty sure they're not. So you combine that with the Ronnie Bell absence at wide receiver. And I think about the Ronnie Bell absence in conjunction with Xavier Worthy. Even though Worthy never played a down for Michigan, I planned on him being on this team this year. So I planned on Ronnie Bell, and I planned on Xavier Worthy. Neither one of them are there. And yet I plugged this game into the model, and our model not only likes Michigan to win, it likes Michigan to cover. I would imagine if that happens, it is a late pull-away add-on score cover, but that's where we are. I mean, Washington last week, the reason I worry about this, and I would never touch it, is they lost to Montana, and no one knows anything about Montana. Montana is a, a ridiculously good defensive team, and that will give Washington trouble all year long. They are not built to get margin on people. They're just not. They are not going to throw a ball up and down the field. Uh, they are, as a result, susceptible to that kind of thing. It doesn't mean they're a bad team. But I know perception right now is that, well, here we go. This game had all the air taken out of its balloon, and Washington's coming in. What are they, really? The answer is they're the exact same team they were going into last week. They just got beat. They got upset. They got beat. We have Michigan winning this game. The model has Michigan covering. I'm not confident in that. I will tell you. I'm going to take Michigan to win, and if you trust our model, which looks a little rickety on this game, then so be it. There are far better value bets out there. Uh, the second game I wanted to touch on is UAB at Georgia. This is a 3.30 Eastern time kickoff on ESPN2. Now, my question when I look at this is, I wonder, where would Bill Clark's team, that being UAB, of course, where would they rank on Georgia's schedule, toughness-wise? Because Georgia plays Vanderbilt, obviously. Uh, you play Kentucky, you play Missouri, you play South Carolina, you play Tennessee. How's the East going to shake out this year? And where would UAB finish in the East? They wouldn't finish last. I don't think they'd finish second to last. So somewhere in between those teams, that's the kind of challenge you have coming in Saturday. Georgia, the line's been fluctuating. It was at 27, 25. The late news is JT Daniels is unlikely to play in this game with what figures to be an oblique injury. Now, it's been easier to get news out of North Korea than it has to get injury updates out of Athens, Georgia this week. It's not even a joke. And uh, so no one really knows, but I don't expect him to play. And with that in mind, what are we seeing? We're seeing Carson Beck Saturday? I don't doubt that Georgia's got a couple of quarterbacks that they could play and they could win this game with. But what we start to watch with Georgia is we start to watch the kinds of game plans that they go into Saturdays with offensively. And when they went into the Clemson game last week, I think it's totally reasonable to theorize that they realized early on they didn't have to open up the playbook and they could just sledgehammer their way to a win, and they did. Okay, that's great. Is that going to be the recipe 12 weeks out of the year? No. And eventually, they're going to have to exercise a little bit more of this passing game. Is this the kind of game that they are going to do that in? I don't know. I don't know, because I could easily see uh, some uncertainty at quarterback early on in this one. UAB's a very good team in their own right, so it's not like you're dictating terms here. UAB's going to have something to say about this. Uh, we got Georgia winning. I'll take UAB in the points. I, I got, got them at 26, I think. Uh, right now it's at 24 and a half. I'm seeing that number on our board. I, I would take UAB in anything above 24. That is not an official play. That's just where I would lean there. Uh, survive and advance. Just win and advance. That's Georgia's mentality this week. Speaking of sneaky games, this one's a lot sneakier. App State is at Miami this Saturday. This is a 7 o'clock kickoff on ESPNU. The line is now up to 9. When we were talking the other night, it was at 7. So someone's betting some money on the Canes. I, it was not me. I really went back and dug into the Miami-Alabama game again. I wanted to watch Miami. Everyone, if you watch the replay, you're watching Bama. I wanted to watch Miami. I don't know how to tell you this because it sounds stupid, but when they were down 41-3, to I legitimately found myself thinking, De'Eric King's played a pretty good game. I know that sounds out of this world, 
That's just how good Bama played the other last week. De'Eric King did not play bad at all. There were very, very tight windows to try and throw the ball in. He got harassed all afternoon and still hung in the pocket and made some difficult throws at times, and they got blown out. Now, what I'm telling you is all that means is Miami can't hang with Alabama. They could win the rest of their games for all we know. This is not a bad team. I, we probably bumped them a little bit too far in the JP poll. We should not have bumped them. So I will disagree with the model again on that. It's the model's fault when we're wrong. It's my, uh, it's my fault when we're right. So then we look at the schedule here. It's obvious why this number's where it is. This is a balanced App State offense now. So what's getting tested this week is not Derek King. What's getting tested this week is Miami. Specifically, up front, can't get pushed around again. Secondary, tackling, can't have those issues in week two. They got to win this game. I mean, for obvious reasons, they got to win this game. We have got Miami winning. We think the number's right. Eight and a half or nine is what the model has it at. So I, I'll, I'll take Miami to win and cover. There is no strong feel here. It's, it kind of feels like the Georgia UAB game, except the number's a lot tighter. Survive and advance. They got Michigan State coming in next week. Start to build something. Make this your week one. Learn from last week. Make this your week one. Here is a fun one. This one's getting more on the radar as the week goes on. North Carolina State in Starkville to take on Mississippi State. The Wolfpack, as of now, you could find minus one out there. You could find minus two and a half out there. The number's all over the place. But the important thing to note is, as of this Thursday evening, NC State's favored at Mississippi State. Do we think they should be? Well, apparently all of America does. I went on Twitter about, what, five o'clock today, and I said, have I missed it? Is anyone out there picking Mississippi State? I mean, NC State, as far as my anecdotal observations, has been the most public pick slash bet of the week on a game where the number's under a field goal. It's one thing if you're betting a, or picking a four-touchdown favorite. This game, at least according to the odds, is supposed to be razor tight. And I'm in a classic early season conundrum because you know what my propensity and anyone with good sense propensity should be when you see an entire herd, that's exactly what people look like when they're on the same side, a herd of people just rushing towards a one-point favorite waving their money in their hand. You know where you're supposed to go. But here's the problem. I agree with them. I think NC State's going to win the game. I think it's a horrible matchup offensively for Mississippi State. I think this defensive staff at NC State, you look at some of their history, tailor-made to defend this offense. Nothing's going to surprise them. They know exactly what they have defensively, and they know exactly what they're facing. And also, they can run the ball. And that's what Louisiana Tech could not do last week. I think NC State's going to win. I'll take them to cover. I hate being in this spot. I mean, I, I wish the rest of you would get on the other side of the fence so I could feel a little more comfortable over here. But I, I can't – I mean, there, there, is no, there is no quantifiable metric that says when everyone's over there, that changes the outcome of a game. I just don't like it when everyone's over there. But I'm going to go with NC State anyway. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, this to me is the most underrated game of the weekend. Missouri at Kentucky. This is a 7.30 Eastern time kickoff. It's on SEC Network. I would strongly encourage you to check this game out. The total has ballooned this week, four or five points. It's at 56 right now. I still don't think it's high enough. I am i don't like being late on numbers, but I still think the over is to play here, even at 56. But let's talk about this. Tyler Beatty needs a big game. That's the running back for Missouri. Needs a big game. Had one last week, but he needs to keep Kentucky off the field because all of a sudden we have to talk about Kentucky's passing game and Will Levis and this up-tempo uh, – dare I say high octane after one week offense they're running? Uh, here's what we've seen in the past. I got a sneaking suspicion about this game. There is no data that is guiding this, mind you, but I've got a sneaking suspicion about this game. I did this one time last year and it paid off big. I think it was West Virginia. It was a West Virginia game. I just flat out predicted turnovers. Here's what I think is going to happen. I think that I watched Missouri last week. I watched some of their game. They ended up with nine sacks. They can pressure the quarterback. Uh, Kentucky's feeling really good about this passing game right now. What I think is, if that Missouri ground game can get off to a decent start, and or if they can grab the lead, start limiting possessions, it could create just enough urgency on that Kentucky side to where they make just enough bad decisions at quarterback to where they turn the ball over just enough times to where not only does Missouri cover this 5.5, I'm going to pick Missouri to pull a mild upset in Lexington. So I'll take Mizzou plus the points, and I will take the Tigers to win. 
I do not advise you to predict turnovers. This is strictly a gut thing. Uh, our model disagrees with what I just said. Our model likes Kentucky to cover. So I'm going against the model a lot this week, actually. But none of these are official picks, mind you. It's just kind of a, a little opinion that I'm giving you. Also, Pitt at Tennessee, another one of those ACC games where they're in an SEC building and the ACC team is the small favorite. That's right. Close your eyes, children. It wasn't always this way, but Pitt is favored in Neyland Stadium by three. This is a noon kickoff. Director Collin does not predict Neyland to be sold out. He does not predict Neyland to be overflowing, uh, but should be a good crowd there nonetheless. This is going to be a really good game. Uh, it's a really good noon window game, too. The big unknown here is can Tennessee run the ball successfully? Because last week against Bowling Green was no kind of test at all. And this week is. I mean, this is a very, very, this is probably safe to say a top 10 to top 15 caliber run defense in the country. And Pitt, uh, it could be better. I'm being conservative with that. If Pitt earns the right to rush the passer in this game, meaning if Tennessee can't move the chains and they're constantly behind the eight ball, third and seven plus, Pitt will win this game. No question about it, because that pass rush will get after Joe Milton. Uh, he is not through one sample size against one of the worst defenses on God's green earth in Bowling Green, has not shown that he has made some quantum leap on touch passes. Still a work in progress. Uh, Pitt can really mess you up. They can really mess you up. So the only answer there is make sure we're dealing with third and twos and not third and sevens. Director Collin and I are disagreeing here. Director Collin's rolling with Tennessee. I had Tennessee written down, and then I scribbled through it, and I wrote Pitt. I closed my eyes when I did it. I have no feel on the point spread whatsoever, but I'm taking Pitt to win narrowly. And if Tennessee wins, then that's great, and that means they're ahead of schedule. It's funny, though, if you look at it, you would think, oh, these two know nothing about each other. Pitt never plays Tennessee. Well, that may be true, but Pat Narduzzi, who is the head coach at Pitt, has faced Josh Heupel a couple of times at UCF in the past few years. Uh, Banks is the defensive coordinator at Tennessee, and I think he was at Penn State, and they – play Pitt every year. So there is a striking, uh, maybe even a shocking amount of familiarity between these two staffs. Uh, Josh Heupel said it doesn't matter this week, so I'm not going to waste any more time talking about that.